Today I want to talk to you about bad company. Now, how many of y'all from the 70s? Bad company. I know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're under 50. Everybody say bad, bad. company. I want to talk to you today about relationships. Healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. And how relationships impact every single one of us. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to 1 Kings First Kings in the Old Testament. Relationships are super powerful. Matter of fact, I remember hearing a statistic one time that research shows that we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. I want you to think about that. You become and I become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. Warren Buffett, the well-known investor, said it's better to hang out with people better than you. Pick out associates whose behavior is better than yours. Watch this, and you will drift in that direction. The reality is, is that our relationships impact our lives. Some relationships add to us. Some relationships multiply our lives, but some subtract. And unfortunately, some even divide. I'm so grateful for the relationships that I've had. And I talk about the relationships many, many times throughout the years. I think about Pastor Doug Armand, who I literally was in his small group. He was at Little Creek, he's at Little Creek Campus. He hosts here on the weekend that I was in his small group 37 years ago. How many of y'all want to know what Pastor Steve was like when he got saved? Come on, just raise your hand. Okay, let me just help you. I was a mess. But how many of y'all grateful that Jesus changes people's lives? Come on. Are y'all grateful for that? And the power of discipleship, the power of having people pour into your life. I think of Pastor Doug Armand. I think of Pastor Randy Craighead, who's been on our team for 23 years, like a brother to me. I think of Pastor Jim LaFoon. I've known him 25 years. Pastor Jacob Aranza, I've walked with him for 29 years. Pastor Jeff Little, who preaches here once a year. I think about him. 25 years. Steve Agalas, 15 years. All of these men. Remember, you become the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Question, are you spending your time with people that average? and multiply your life. Does anybody know you? Do you really do life with godly people? Do they push, push you to knowing Christ more, to being a better man, a better woman, a better husband, a better wife, a better, watch this, a, a better leader in any sphere that God has placed you? Do you have people in your life like that? A mentor of mine, Pastor Craig Rochelle from Life Church, and I had a year where once a month he would pour into my life. It was very transformational, 2009. And here's what Pastor Craig says. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. The people that you hang out with today are shaping the person you will become tomorrow. Wow. 1938, Harvard research study embarked on a decades long, it's been going on for 85 years, And the question they wanted to answer is, what makes people happy in life? And so every two years, they had 729 participants, 724 to be exact. And every two years, they would check in and they would evaluate what are the things in your life that make you most happy. And what is surprising and astounding is it wasn't career achievement. It's not money, it's not exercise or healthy diet. The consistent theme that they got relative to feedback over 85 years is this. The thing that makes people most fulfilled and most happy is positive, life-giving relationships. Question, do you have any like that in your life? Is there people you do life with, that you hang out with, that encourage you to be a godly man, a godly woman, to push you to become better? Or are they always subtracting, and dividing? Wow. Ungodly and unhealthy influences can cause us, yes, to get off track. Listening to the wrong people, the wrong advice, people that don't know you. They really don't know you, and yet they're sidetracking your life. Paul speaks of this. Here's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not, watch this, do not be misled. Bad company. Everybody say bad company. Come on, there's the title. 
bad company corrupts good morals, good character. Pastor, I don't know what happened. I just felt like I was in love with God. I felt like I was on track. I felt like I was making good decisions. And I don't know. You guys all know people like that. You got saved with them. They gave their heart to Christ. And yet you don't know where they are today. I tell you what, you go back. Maybe it was a disappointment. They didn't manage well. But nine times out of ten, it's they got with the wrong crowd. Bad company corrupts, notice, good morals, good character. Now the converse is true as well. Good company. Everybody say good company. Good company strengthens good character. Bad company reduces and misdirects good character. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Who are you hanging around with? Are they pushing you to become a godly man, a godly woman? People that do life with you, people that know you, that walk with you. Bad company corrupts good character. It's not wise to pray and ask God to deliver you from an addiction, and yet you hang around with the same people that reinforce that addiction. A pastor, you know what, I struggle with alcohol, I got this problem, I got this addiction, and yeah, well then why do you hang out after work with the same people that reinforce the same thing? In other words, are you making strategic choice? You can go to Freedom Weekend, you can get hands laid on you, but if you go back to the same crowd that reinforces the same thing, it's not wise. Why? Because bad company corrupts good character. Compromises your decisions, it impacts your life. So, what are we doing? We're studying Old Testament biblical kings, ancient kings. And we're looking at six in this series. Today, I want to talk to you about King Jehoshaphat. Who is King Jehoshaphat? All right, so here's how it goes the kingdom, the kingdom of Israel at one time was one nation, the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, King David. King Solomon, they united the kingdom of Israel. It was one nation. They were on top politically, with their military, with their commerce. I mean, they were powerful. Religiously, I mean, they were powerful. King David, King Solomon, but King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he actually split the nation. A lot of reasons why he was ungodly, and he split the nation. And the nation was actually split, watch this, into the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom consisted of the 10 tribes. Remember, there was 12 tribes. Jacob had 12 sons. The 12 tribes of Israel that made up the nation of Israel. 10 of those tribes were in the north. They now took and maintained the name, the nation of Israel. But the southern two tribes are now called the kingdom of Judah. So you have the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. The king of Israel I'm going to talk about today, his name was Ahab. And Ahab's wife, again, we've heard about it, heard about her, is that wicked queen, watch this, Jezebel. So Ahab is wicked, he doesn't serve the Lord, and he's married to Jezebel, who's wicked, she doesn't serve the Lord. But the king of the southern kingdom, his name is Jehoshaphat. He served God. He was a righteous man, but he made some improper choices. He was misled. Why? Because bad company corrupts good character. Good company strengthens good character. Bad company corrupts good character. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. Here's what the Bible says. Now Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Think about that. He was a wicked king, but Jehoshaphat had just the opposite reputation. Remember, Ahab is the king of the northern tribes, the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat is the king of the two southern tribes, the king of Judah. Listen to this. 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 3. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. Actually, David was his great, great, great grandfather. Listen to what he says. And he walked in the former ways of his father, David, and he did not seek the Baals. He didn't worship on the high places, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was godly. Ahab, the king of Israel, was wicked. Now, here's what happened. It's interesting when you think about it. This one nation, they were all together, cousins and brothers and sisters, and then there was a division. 
You know what happened with King Ahab? There was a city up there called Ramoth Gilead, right on the border of, of Israel on the northern side, kind of the northeastern side. And you had Arman then, A-R-A-M, which is now modern day Syria. They actually took over one of those cities and Ahab needed help. He's like, man, I gotta take this city back. We need this city. Ah, I'm gonna call for my southern friend. I hope he'll be my friend. <laughs> I hope he'll relate to me. I hope he'll come help me. I need Jehoshaphat's help. Watch this. Here it is. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3. Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? He sends a message. Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, sends a message to the southern king of Judah. He says, will you go with me? I need some help. And he, that is Jehoshaphat, answered, I am as you are and my people as your people. We will be with you in every way. Uh-oh, we have an alliance forming here. Ahab asks and Jehoshaphat jumps in. Bad move, Jehoshaphat, because he's bad company. So many times we think something is a good idea, but is it a God idea? I have a map, actually, to show you guys. I think this will help all of you at all of our locations, those that are watching online. You'll see this. So the southern kingdom, it really only consists of two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And it's, watch this, this is ruled and governed by a good king, Jehoshaphat. Look at the northern tribe. Oh, ten tribes up there consist of Israel. Look at Ramoth Gilead, the northeastern side, Arman, A-R-A-M, Syria. Watch this. They took it over, and Ahab says, I need some help, Jehoshaphat. Can you come help me? Jehoshaphat thought, you know what? Why not? Good ideas are not always God ideas. Think about that. Because bad company corrupts good character. We can understand the nostalgic sense that Jehoshaphat had. He, he wanted the family reunited. He was tired of going to family reunions and, and a lot of the kids weren't there. A lot of the cousins weren't there. He thought, man, I, 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 maybe this is the opportunity to pull everybody together. Maybe this is it. We can get everybody together. This is a good idea. The problem was, is that was a wicked man and a wicked wife. It was a wicked, they weren't worshiping Jehovah God. And he went to go help them out. Matter of fact, Jehoshaphat even went up to another level. He had a he had a son, Jehoram, and he said, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to try to unite this thing back together. Let me, I'm going to even have my son marry Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. The problem was Athaliah was wicked too, and she caused devastation to Judah later on. Sometimes a good idea, it's not a God idea. How the devil often deceives us. How many people have I talked to? How many business people I've talked to? They went into a business relationship with somebody that was not a good person, wasn't a godly person. They thought, well, you know what? And they tried to justify it. And, well, you know what? After all, we'll kind of have some profits and we'll do some good in the community. The problem is, is you're unevenly yoked with somebody that doesn't know God. Well, that's a good idea. And, and after all, maybe we'll do some good. Well, wait, time out, time out, time out. That's an Ahab. That's a person that doesn't serve God. They're not a covenant with God. How many ladies have I talked? Well, I'm going to go date this guy. You know what? He's not a Christian, but maybe I'll lead him to Christ. No, maybe he'll lead your soul to hell. That was strong preaching, but it was necessary. I mean, it seems good. It seems right. I can be a light. No, you'll be overcome by darkness. The fact of the matter is sometimes we think it's a good idea, but, but, but is it a God idea? Is it a God? He went up thinking, well, maybe it's a good idea, but it wasn't God. It wasn't God's will. It wasn't God's plan. If God wants you to give you something, he'll give it to you. And by the way, what you compromise to keep, God is not going to ask you to do something to compromise your values, your godly principles, godly relationship. God's not going to ask you to do it. He doesn't cause you to compromise to get something. By the way, what you compromise to get, you'll lose in the end. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. We don't have to manipulate. We don't have to scheme. We can receive what God is giving us. So the devil played a massive trick on Jehoshaphat. He talked him into something. So right before they're getting ready to go into this battle, Jehoshaphat raises his hand and goes, um, 
uh, cousin Ahab, uh, listen, uh, can, is there any like prophets? Can we inquire of the Lord? Like, is this a good idea? Is this like, is God into this? So right, right when they're getting ready to go to battle, he goes, time out, time out, time out. Let's ask the prophets if this is a good idea. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse four. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, that's to Ahab, please inquire uh, for the Lord, for the word of the Lord today. Jehoshaphat thought, you know what? Let me make sure this is God's will. And so you know what Ahab does? Watch this. Remember, he's a wicked king. Here's what he does. He gets 400 false prophets. Isn't it amazing? Birds of a feather flock together. Isn't that it? All these false prophets, you know, like, yeah, go for it. You and Jehoshaphat, you'll take them out. You'll get the city back. It'll be powerful. You should do it. But there was a check. There was a little check in Jehoshaphat's heart. He thought, mm, I'm not sure about this. Is there any other prophets left? Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 6. But Jehoshaphat said, is there, still, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Is there like one other man of God? I want to hear from a man of God. Is there, he, I'm, I'm not sure about these guys. And listen to what Ahab says. He answers in verse 7. Yes, there's still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. You know why he hates him? Because he told him the truth. Isn't it amazing people that tell you the truth sometimes? It's like, we don't want to know the truth. We're like, well, I don't like it. So I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me but always evil. His name is Micaiah. He's the son of Emma. Well, the fact of the matter is, is this was a sign. Are the people you hanging around with, do they want to hear the voice of God? Is there any Micaiahs around that can speak into your life? That the, 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 the bridge is out. You're getting ready to go off the bridge. You're, you're getting ready to go off the road. In other words, in other words, it's amazing how he just, hung, he just got people around his life that were ungodly. He didn't get people to speak truth to him. Nobody really, let me tell you, there were just 400 false prophets. That was it. And finally he goes, is there any man of God that's got the word of the Lord here? And one guy says to him, he goes, I'm, that's not wisdom. But go ahead and do it. You're going to do it anyway. He's sarcastic. He goes, well, you're going to do it anyway. It's not, it's not good. Sure enough, Jehoshaphat linked up. Remember, bad company corrupts good character. So he links up with Ahab and they go into battle. Well, you know what's gonna happen. You know what exactly is gonna happen. Ahab is killed and Jehoshaphat is almost killed. How many times do we get into bad situations because we're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. We're on the wrong playground with the wrong playmates with the wrong play toys. And God was trying to warn him the whole time. So let me give you guys four things that we can do to break up with bad company. Y'all ready? Say amen. amen. Here we go. The first thing you can do is flee ungodly influences. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to the house in Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat didn't say, now that Ahab is dead, let me go to Samaria. Let me start forming alliance. Hey, let's get the 400 false prophets. Hey, guys, after all, maybe this can be my city up here. He got out of that place. He ran as fast as he could. By the way, there wasn't a slow walk deal. It's like he saw it, just like Joseph with Potiphar's wife. He's like, boom, I'm out of here. In other words, he ran fast. He separated himself for that. Why is that, Pastor? Because bad company corrupts good character. Good company reinforces. It reinforces good character. How many people are in your life that maybe are causing you to compromise biblical values and Biblical truth, and wow, pastor, you know what, after all, you know, I'm just trying to be a light. Yeah, that's fine, but do they even know you're a Christian? I mean, can you even talk about Christ? There's such a pressure in our culture for us to capitulate and for us to give in because you used to get extra credit for being a Christian. Now you almost get a demerit. I mean, can, does anybody know that you believe in Christ? If there's a biblical worldview, well, well, if you're only with people that reinforce what you're not, at some point in time, you'll become what they are. Should I say that again? If you're only around people that reinforce what you're not, at some point you'll be. In other words, God has called you to be holy and godly and a light and make a difference to influence them, not be influenced by them. You, you gotta be willing to make a clean break. Some of you guys are just playing around with darkness. You, 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 let me tell you, you hang around with the beehive long enough, you're gonna get stung. You, some of you guys know my testimony and 
when I finally made a clean break, I got saved October 27, 1987. I was 18. I turned 19, basically a month later, December 3rd. And my friends kept talking to me, yeah, come on, go out, man. We go party, man. We're going to go party. We're going to go party. And I just kept giving in. I kept giving in. I kept giving in. I kept giving in. And then December 31st, 1987. I remember I was in an uptown bar, Fat Harry's, and my friends were there. And I'd give it, I'd given it, y'all laugh because some of y'all been there. But anyway, <laughs> ha, 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 I, I was there that night too, Pastor. I know you were. December 31st, 1987, I'd given, a, I'd given a tape series to my friend Vince. And then in the series, it was Fear Not. Everybody say, Fear Not. Fear not. Stand still. Stand still. Hold, your peace. Hold your peace. Go forward. I preach messages on that now. It's very impacting. It was one of the first ones, Book of Exodus. God told him at the Red Sea. And so I've been preaching to my friend Vince. I've been sharing Christ. The problem was my witness was not lying. My walk and my talk were incongruent. And I kept telling him, you need to share Christ. He's like, what? You're, no, you're no different than any of us. So we're doing the big countdown, December 31st, 1987. We're at one minute, and then 30 seconds, then we're at 10, 9. And we're all getting ready to do these big shots, Jägermeister, the whole thing. And, and here comes Vince. He comes through the crowd. It's like 10, 9. He goes, hey, Steve, hey, go forward. And I mean, I was immediately sober. I went home. I called those guys the next day. I said, I'm I'm not partying with you anymore. I'm not living that lifestyle. I'm going to serve God. I don't care if I don't have any friends. I'm going to, and listen, listen, listen. And you know, within one week, within one week, Vince surrendered his heart to Christ. And here's what he said. I was just waiting to see if it was really true in you. So here's my question. Who's waiting for you to sell out to God? Everybody say, flee. Flee. Man, you got to get out of that stuff. Flee the darkness. Run from that stuff. Number two, listen to and follow godly counsel even when it's not easy. When Jehoshaphat returned to Jerusalem, he got into the company of a prophet by the name of Jehu. Jehu rebuked him. And Jehoshaphat, listen. Listen to the Second Chronicles. I love the Bible. It's so practical. Look what it says. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2. Jehu the seer. So he, he runs back. He gets out of that land of compromise. He runs back, and he gets back to Judah. And Jehu the seer, the son of Ham, uh, uh, I can't even say these words. But anyway, Hamaniah went out to meet him and said to the king, should you, watch this, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? In other words, why did you go up there to to your cousin? He doesn't love God. His wife doesn't love God. They're, 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 they're doing wicked things in the high places. He says, because of this, the wrath of the Lord. You're, you're, you're going to be disciplined by God. You shouldn't have done that. Jehoshaphat took Jehu's words to heart and said, I'll never do that again. How many times as a friend? Do, is there any Jehus in your life? Is there anybody that can speak the word of the Lord to you? He had a word from God. Maybe you're in a business situation. You're in a compromising situation. Maybe it's a relationship situation. Is there anybody that can can get your attention? The problem is we capitulate, right? We want to give in. We want to give in to all the pressures around. And you need a man, ladies, you need a woman that will be able to speak the word of the Lord to be able to help give clarity to your life. Separate from the ungodly. Separate from that. Make wise choices, godly choices. Proverbs 27, verse 6, the problem is this, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but kisses, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. We, we, wanna, we don't want truth anymore. We don't like truth. By the way, our culture doesn't like truth. We don't like it. Because after all, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. <laughs> Whatever you feel is truth. That's why you can be a dog if you want today, a cat today, a frog, you can be anything you want. How ridiculous is that? There is truth. There's an objective right and there's a wrong. And you know that's true. The fact of the matter is is this. The wounds of the friend are better. Is there anybody close enough to you that really knows you that can speak the truth to you? Do you know how many times Pastor Randy, Pastor Doug, Pastor Jacob, Pastor Jim, people that know my life, confronted me about things. And by the way, Pastor Doug and Pastor Randy technically work for me, but I submit to them because I submit to their godly character because they're great husbands, they're great fathers, and and there's power in that. In other words, is there anybody that you do life with that really knows you, that can be a Jehu to you, get your attention? 
What you're doing is not good. It's hurting your life. The bridge is out. Hey, hey, the bridge is out. You're about to go in the canal. Excuse me, the bayou. (laughs) What I've learned, what I've found and I've walked with God is you can either learn from revelation or tribulation. Revelation is God's word through a Jehu. The stove is hot. Don't touch it. Mm, I'm not sure. Ah! That's called tribulation. The word is called revelation. I want to learn from God, godly men, godly people. I want to hear revelation so I don't have to have the pain of tribulation. Come on. How many all receive that? Revelation. I love Christian philosopher and author C.S. Lewis. He said, God whispers to you. Watch this. He whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks it in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. God's trying to get your attention. Is there anybody close enough to you that can speak the truth to you? Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up. Everybody say, grow up. We grow up. People that are emotionally driven, they never grown up. We'll grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Godly relationships require truth in love. But they require truth. They require truth. So Jehu comes back. He confronted him with truth and he loved him too. Watch. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse three. There is, however, some good in you. Isn't that good? He says, you're a good man, for you have rid the land of the Ashtoreth poles, and you've set your heart on pleasing God. And so we have to have wisdom in that, how we deliver the truth. And, and, and I understand the principle of, you know, couching it, you know, the sandwich, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You got to say the good. But, but the problem is we go to such extremes today where you got to tell somebody, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're great, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're great. You're wonderful, you're wonderful. You're almost God. You're not God, but you're close, you're close. You're great, you're great, you're great, great. There's this little, tiny, small thing. Can I share that with you? You're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing. If you require that much emotional energy for friends to be able to actually share anything insightful to you, they're going to go, at too much work. (laughs) Just be open. Everybody say, be open. open. Yes, you want truth, and yes, you should be in love, but we need truth. We are in a culture where they can't handle truth. That's why we are where we are. That's why churches are where they are. That's why people are where we are. That's why we are as a civilization. Why? Because people can't handle truth. Because they've so been baptized and identified with emotions, they can't handle truth. (laughs) Number three, be the godly influence. Pastor, be nice. I'm trying. (laughs) I'm really trying. I'm just trying to teach the Bible. I can't wait till we're out of this series. My God, this thing is so filled with truth. Sometimes that serum's good for you. How many are grateful for God's word? Come on. How many are grateful for that? It's always good. Number three, be the godly influence. God has created each of us to have influence and be servant leaders. Jehoshaphat's like, all right, I've learned. I've learned. That was a bad move. Why? Because bad company corrupts good character. Remember, they started out good, but they were around the wrong people. They didn't listen to the right voices. They kept shutting off, shutting off, shutting off until they finally got everybody around them that just agreed with them that never told them the truth. Ah, but he wised up. Watch this. 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 4. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. In other words, he goes, I'm gonna bring everybody back. Why? Because I've now now made a decision. I'm not gonna be influenced by the darkness, I'm gonna be an influencer in the light. In other words, you know there's two dimensions, there's two devices that measure temperature, that deal with temperature. One is a thermometer, the other is a thermostat. A thermometer, you know what it does? It goes up and down based upon its environment. Is that that how you are? You get with somebody, we're gonna just act, you know, like the devil with one group, but over here, we're gonna pray and believe God. But you get over this group, you act like this, you get over this group, that's called being a thermometer. God's not called you to be a thermometer, he's called you to be a thermostat where you set the temperature, where you set the godly atmosphere, where you set what God says. God wants you to be the man and the woman that he's created you to be, and you can do it. Be the influencer, be the salt, be the light. Be the one. We need men and women that stand up and be salt and light. 
Man, this generation needs it. I tell you, when I went to college at Tulane University, which is not a Christian college. Thought I'd share that with you. We didn't study the New Testament our freshman year. And I decided, you know what? I'm just going to be the light, man. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to love God. I wasn't perfect. I'm going to tell you something. I made a decision. You can make a decision to be the light. Let me give you the fourth and final thing. Y'all learning things that's helping anybody? All right, I love this. Here it is. I'm wrapping it up. Remember, everybody say bad company. Corrupts. Good character. Remember, they started out with good character. Have you, cha- have you changed dance partners halfway through the dance? I was with these people. We were on fire for God. But then you got hurt. You got disappointed. You started isolating. And now nobody's in your life. And so next thing you know, because you have a relationship, you have to hang out with somebody. So you kind of go back. You go back to those old things. You go back to those old relationships. You go back doing the same things you used to do. And you wonder why, you, you wonder why that addiction, if, you, if you're dealing with an alcohol addiction, don't go back to the places that, 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 that are reinforcing that addiction. Amen. Get away from that. Run from that. Flee from that. Whatever it is. Whatever your chance. Get around people that have solutions that don't have the same problems. And others, people that will help you. I'm talking about doing life with them. Hanging out with them. Going to a small group with them, going to church with them, being with them. Let me give you the fourth and final thing. Here it is. Take your battles to the Lord, but notice, notice, you don't do it alone. Sometimes we listen to bad company, we end up in a crisis. That's what he did, crisis up there. But he comes back. He comes back. After word got around that Ahab was killed and Jehoshaphat was beaten badly, now the devil's circling. Here it is. Ah, Jehoshaphat's weak. He's weak. All the surrounding nations thought, you know what, we're going to get him now. We're going to get him now. Why? Because he's weak. They heard about the defeat up there and, and all the enemy. You know what the enemy does? When you're weak and filled with bitterness, by the way, the number one bridge of the enemy into your soul is unforgiveness and bitterness. The Bible says, give no place to the devil. The Greek word, the English word place, the Greek word is topos, where we get the English word topography from. You want to give place to the enemy in your soul, have unforgiveness, bitterness. Boy, it's just like whistling. Come here, devil. Just do whatever you want in my life. Well, here it is. The enemies surrounding Jehoshaphat. They all heard there's weakness. And here comes the devil. He's surrounding him. So what does Jehoshaphat do? He's learned. Number one, remember this. Bad company corrupts good morals, but good company strengthens good, good character. Strengthens it. Look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. After this, the Moabites, the Amorites... With some of the Menuhites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. And some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom and from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already, they're already there in the Hazaran Tamar. That's in Gedi. They're already there. Basically, the enemies came from the north, the south, the east, and the west because they heard you're weak. What did he do? Oh, gosh. The Bible says, look at verse 3. He was alarmed. But... Boy, he made some good choices. But he resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek him, seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek. In other words, in other words, he called his prayer partners. Do you have any prayer partners in your life? In other words, guys, men, women, you're, you're in business, you're struggling. Is there anybody that you can call and say, man, I'm struggling, I need help. Can you just pray with me? You're struggling in your marriage, struggling with your kids, struggling in business, struggling in life, your body, your mind. Do you have any friends? You gotta be vulnerable to have friends. You gotta be willing, by the way, you gotta be willing to be known if you have friends, if you really live with people. You gotta be willing to be known. I thank God for the prayer partners in my life. Matter of fact, about three, four weeks ago, I called one of them and I was just discouraged. By the way, Pastor Steve gets discouraged. Man, I get in valleys too. And, I, and man, he just started praying with me and, and then really just started preaching faith to me and, and building my faith. And why, why is that? In other words, you gotta be open and vulnerable. Do you have any prayer partners? Is there anybody who can pray with you? The power of coming together and praying, couples coming together and praying, friends coming together and praying, small groups coming. That's why it's important to be in a group. Be with other Christian people. If you don't have those people in your life, you got to ask your question. If you're in trouble right now, is there one person that you can call that, watch this, that, that is a friend of yours that you do life with that will pray with you? Yeah. Is there anybody? We want to help you at this church. We want to help get you in a small group. 
Find some friends. Connect with people. God starts speaking right here. Why? Bad company corrupts good character, but good company strengthens good character. He calls his prayer partners. Come on, I need prayer. The enemy's trying to come against us. We're gathering together. I thank God the men that have been in my life, I think I've got, uh, gathered them together. Doug and Randy and Pastor Jacob and Jim and Pastor Steve Agalas. Man, he preached a great word last summer. And Pastor Jeff, and they've strengthened and, and, and walked with us and walked with me as a pastor, as a, as a husband, as a father, as a, as, as a Christian man. Is there any partners you got? You're like, God wants to give you some prayer partners. When you're going through struggles that you can cry out. So God speaks and gives them strategy. You know what he says? Look at this, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22. And as I began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the man. The Lord spoke to him. Jehoshaphat, send out the worship leaders first. What? The worship leaders. Send the praise team out first. The praise team. Dan and Alex? And Ben? Send these guys? Jeffrey, I mean, send, send, send them out. They're, they're the, they're, they're, yeah, send, send the praise. Why? Because, let me tell you, praise does in the supernatural realm what you cannot even come close to doing in the natural realm. <laughs> by, by the way, let me help everyone. We have so many new people at our church. Our praise and worship time, our 20 minutes of singing before, that's not the spinach dip before the meal. <laughs> nah, I don't want the spinach dip. I'm just coming for the ribeye. Or maybe today it's salmon. Actually, maybe today's ribs. No, no, we need, we need, how many of you know you need the worship and the presence of God? Because that cuts back the darkness. That softens the heart. I know some of you guys that are new at church, you can't, you're like, I don't like that part. I just like, I like Steve's talk. I like the talk. I don't like the singing parts. A little weird. You know, the hands go up and I'm not sure about all that, you know. So you get new, you know, it's just like, I don't like that. And then one day you just kind of feel it, you know. The worship leader goes, if you feel comfortable lifting your hands, you know, you're just like, you know what, I've been waiting here for about six months, I'm going to do it. You just kind of go, <laughs> kind of look if your neighbor's watching, you know, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to do the hand thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Pastor, do you have to raise hands at Church King? No, but you get to. Why is that? It's a universal sign of surrender, God. I surrender to you. How many of you know God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life? Come on, somebody. God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. So the worship, everybody say worship. But he wasn't worshiping alone. That's why corporate worship is so important. Yes, we need personal worship. Yes, we need personal prayer, but there's something about prayer partners. You know what Sunday morning is? Saturday night service? It's worship partners. You're worshiping together. There's corporate blessing. There's corporate flow. There's corporate anointing. There's a power to break things off of your life. Even before you get to the word. I'm not diminishing the word. I lift high the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. But worship actually prepares the heart for the receiving of the word. It goes together. It's the meal. Both of them are the meal. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles chapter 22, 20, verse 22, and as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were, everybody say it, defeated. Pastor, I want my enemies defeated. You need some prayer partners. You need some prayer partners. Why is that, Pastor? Because good company, it strengthens good character. Godly men, godly women around your life strengthen you. And build and layer into your soul godly values and God that, that know you. They got to know you. Do they know you? Are you vulnerable to them? Do you do life with them? Go to work and church and school and they see you and all the I mean, so godly people. I thank God. You got to be willing to be vulnerable to people that do life with you and God will give you prayer partners. And when you do, I'm telling you, you cry out to God. God's power will come down and the enemies in your life will be defeated. Come on, y'all receive that word? Y'all receive that? I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their heads. I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their heads. The first step to coming into a relationship with God is recognizing your need for Jesus. And maybe you're away from God, or maybe you once had a relationship, you've walked away from God. The Bible says it's three steps. One, all of us have sinned. You've gotta admit that you're a sinner. A sinner needs a savior. It's not just a mistake, it's called sin. And a sinner needs a savior. If you're away from God, the Bible says you've got to first confess that all of us have sinned. 
and come short of the glory of God. Number two, the second thing you got to believe is Romans 6, 23. The payment for sin is death. Somebody's got to die for your sin and my sin. But the gift of God is Christ Jesus. Jesus died in our place. So number one, you got to believe that all of us have sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. We need a savior. Christ is the one who pays for our sin. And then number three, you've got to believe this. You've got to personally confess. I can confess with you, but I can't confess for you. I can pray with you, but I can't pray your prayers for you. You've got to confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. If you say, Pastor, pray for me, I need Jesus. Whatever location you're at, those that are watching online, literally around the world, in the jails and the prisons that we're live in right now, I'm, just gonna, I'm asking, God has put you there today. I don't know where you live, but God does. He knows your address and he loves you and he cares about you. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know if you die today that you're ready to stand before God? The count of three, all of our locations and those that are watching online, I'm just gonna ask for a show of hands. Pastor, pray for me, I need Christ, if that's you. One, two, three. Quickly put your hand up high so I can see. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Every one of our locations, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. That's awesome. God bless you. Every single one of you. Church family, can we pray with those that are making a decision to surrender the heart to Christ? Again, we're not praying for them. We're praying with them. We're entering in as the body of Christ, praying with them. The most important prayer they'll ever pray. Let's pray it with them together. Can we do that? Say, dear Jesus, Come on, everyone. Dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life, and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Wow, what an incredible message. And I really hope that you're walking away encouraged and full of hope that God is with you and God loves you. And I do want to take a second to talk to those of you who may be making a decision right now to commit your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time, or maybe to recommit your life to Christ. If that is you, we are so excited for you. And as a church, we would love nothing more than to just walk alongside you, to show you what it means to follow Jesus. Because we believe that you're leaving the past in the past, and this is not the finish line, it's actually the starting line of an amazing life of following Jesus for the rest of your life. So would you give us the privilege of just following up with you? Give you some resources and helping you as you're beginning to walk out this new life of following Jesus. And again, congratulations. We're so excited for you. And if you do want to be a part of just partnering with us to continue to reach people and build lives, you can always go online to churchofthekingcom slash give to be a part of seeing the gospel go forth and people to hear about Jesus. And lastly, I want to encourage you, if you're not already, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to follow us on Facebook, to really stay up to date with all that God has for us, all the content that we're putting out. Pastor Steve has some powerful messages every single week for us, and we're really growing and learning what it means to, to live out the life that God has for us. So I encourage you to follow along, to be a part of all that God is doing here at Church of the King. And again, we just wanna say thank you for being a part of our service today. We love you guys. We hope you have an awesome rest of the week and we'll see you very soon.